Welcome to Facilitating on Purpose, where we explore ideas together about designing and facilitating learning. Join me to get inspired on your journey to becoming and being a great facilitator wherever you work. I'm your host, Beth kugler Blom. Hello, thank you so much for choosing to listen to this episode today. This is episode 14. And in this one, I interview Chad Littlefield. Chad is the chief experience officer of We and Me. This is an organization whose mission it is to make connection easy. And we're going to talk about making connection easy for facilitators, for groups. How do we foster connection before content? This is a phrase that Chad uses a lot. And I hope you're going to see that he starts off the interview with me, actually fostering connection with me by asking me a question, which helps us go deeper into connecting with each other. This episode has a little bit of a soft start because Chad actually asked me in our pre-meeting when we were planning for the episode, if we could do what he calls an unofficial start. So you'll hear us basically just starting to talk in the episode because our content that we're talking about is actually how to start off in an unofficial way. So we tried to do that in the actual episode itself. A lot of what Chad and I talk about in this episode is about how we can start off our learning events or our meetings with connecting experiences right away. How do we get groups to turn to each other so that they can work really well together? So if you're interested in building connection with and between your groups, I think you're really going to enjoy learning from Chad. Enjoy the show. Okay, so in the realm of the unofficial start, you call this the unofficial start. I call it start before the start. Same thing. Chad, what will you normally do with groups as they are coming into a virtual space? Well, for me, I think the the first thing is like Priya Parker's idea, the author of Art of Gathering, the idea of, you know, meet for purpose, not for time. I want to start off really intentionally. And so I, before I show up to a meeting, whether it's with one other person and we're exploring about working together, or it's a group of 500 that I'm facilitating, I'm thinking about like what's happening in the first 60 seconds that connects to the purpose of why we're there. And so for our context right now, We're diving into this podcast. We're going to talk about the importance of starting and ending and what happens in between and maybe talk about connecting and building rapport with grumpy people that don't want to be there in your uh, learning and sessions. And so a question that I just have for you as a little bit of uh, connection before content here is, and I'll take my own medicine answer too, but I'm curious for you, uh, what's taking up lots of your brain space lately? And I can share my intention for that specific question after we answer, but I might start off, jump on a meeting. Hey, super good to see you. I'm just curious to ask, what's taking up lots of your brain space right now? Oh, so many things. Let me pick one. I think it's just the balance of all the things I have going on in my life and work, you know, and maybe that's something that we all deal with is, you know, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I own my own business, I have people working with me and And then I try to have fun in my life. And, you know, what does that look like? I think coming off the heels of the pandemic, I'm still trying to figure out ways to have fun again with people in groups. And I spend a lot of time online, but I think I'm still searching for how to get back and do more things in person. It's kind of like making space for all the things is really top of mind for me right now. And to try to do it, quote unquote, well, (laughs) in a sense. And I also heard you say that you have so much stuff going on that uh, part of the intent is like uh, beyond fitting it all in, wanting to make sure the stuff that is getting slotted, is getting airtime in your calendar is fun. And that is like bringing joy to it. And even before we started recording, you came on and your unofficial start or start before the start, if you will, was what's bringing you joy uh, right now. And I think there's even just asking that question, you can see that that's like that intention's uh, living out. So if I'm to take my own medicine. Yeah. What's top of mind for you? this week or this moment? For me, I have just enough ADHD to keep me uh, moving forward in like pushing and stretching my own like thinking and and bounds. And so, you know, having spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the questions we ask and uh, Will and I uh, put out this book, Ask Powerful Questions, and that's been out for a long time and the cards and tools and like got that kind of figured out. Um, And it's working really well. And it's not like a set it and forget it. But 
it's been fully explored. And so I have been, what's taking out lots of my brain space and I've been loving and been bringing me lots of joy is pushing into this um, new realm of thinking that right now I'm putting under the, like the larger umbrella of the easy future. Um, and so I've just been thinking a lot about how oftentimes, uh, even my wife and I were grabbing coffee the other day and we brought journals and we've been every once in a while, a couple times a week, been journaling together on a specific word. And don't let that sound overly romantic because we also have a three-year-old and a four-month-old and our no, life is filled with chaos. Romantic. I don't know. <laughs> rarely do we get like, like, you know, these are the 25 minutes that we get a day um, <laughs> to do it's this. It's impressive that you're doing it journaling. You're spending that time journaling, but go on, go on. Whoa, the kids watching TV. I mean, I'm literally talking about like Daniel Tiger last 25 minutes of the show. And so that's how much time we have to, and so we've just been picking a word, uh, a theme word. And so we've done like notice and wonder and love love. And one of the ones we did uh, a few days ago was future. And I realized we both ended feeling like, oh, like tired. It was just heavy. It was like, there's so it, it, cool in some way that we were like, there was lots of possibilities scattered down on a piece of paper. But at the end, we were like, how are we going to possibly make all of this happen? And so I've just been thinking a lot uh, lately about how do we make the future as easy as cracking open a fortune cookie? Like when you crack open a fortune cookie, wouldn't it be cool if the fortune was actually personalized to be like, here's your next step. Do this little thing and it's going to have really drastic impacts on your future. Like that would be awesome. Uh, but that fortune cookie doesn't exist. And so I'm wondering like, what is the the next best thing? And, and from a like a learning design and group development and, and uh, growth perspective, what are the like easiest, lowest hanging fruits that uh, create a, a, as effortless of a pathway as possible toward a future that we actually uh, want? So I've been thinking a lot about that <laughs> along with how in the world you raise little people. That's been taken up a heap of brain space too. I bet. I love so much of what you said. And I feel like I could take that into directions unto itself. But I, I want to take us back to this unofficial start piece, because I think just you asking me that question and me asking you the question, it helped us connect with each other more deeply right off the bat. And I know we've didn't turn on the recording right away. We had been connecting before this, but you and I have never met before. It's important to recognize how important it is to do this kind of deep connection right off the bat. So we're doing that with each other, just the two of us, but how do we do that with our groups? And maybe I should ask first, like, why is that important to do it with groups right away, right off the bat? Yeah. And that's, that's the thing that scares uh, most people. It's not like you know, if I say you have a 10 years to build a relationship with someone, they're like, yeah, we're going to have some deep conversations at some point. The part that scares people or like elevates our, our risk o meter is, wait, you mean in the first minute? What do you mean? I just dive right in. And this is where I want to add a little bit of a clarification for the unofficial start. A characteristic for me um, is it's got to be non-threatening. And by the way, I want to give uh, credit to Mark Collard is the founder of Playmio over in Australia, um, who I actually pulled that phrase unofficial start from him, but there are all sorts in the world. Like you call it the start before the start, the soft start. The idea is that typically we reward people for being late by showing up. So we wait until 9.03 to say, oh, I think so-and-so's on their way. Maybe they're just restarting their Wi-Fi or their whatever. And so we kind of hang around. And, and oftentimes that uh, time is either, depending on the context and who's meeting, it's either silent and everybody productively doing their email or some whatever, or it's chit-chat small talk, which is not necessarily bad, but I'm like, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook uh, is also on the board, or at least was, I don't, I'm not sure about currently, but was on the board for SurveyMonkey. And I have a friend who's on the board for SurveyMonkey. And she walked into this meeting one time um, and just said, hey, everybody, this is a really expensive meeting. Let's get started. That is the, the level of importance that I want to like raise the start before the start. It's not like, hey, it's important to chit chat, to get to know each other, to, to relate. It's actually, no, time is really, really precious. And so can we use it super intentionally and, and really wisely? And so um, for me, the question, uh, what is taking up lots of your brain space right now allows two people or a group to get present with each other and acknowledge, hey, this is what's going on for me right now. This is swirling outside of the context of this meeting. This is what's in my brain. And guess what? Whether I choose to or not, I'm bringing this into the meeting. I can't not. And so just knowing that this is present, like even as we're talking, the fact that you shared this intention toward fun, like actually is going to shift my behavior and what I say and how I frame things and the stories that I choose to pull out in our podcast in the spirit of creating and injecting a little bit more fun, even into what we're doing right now. And so I think, yeah, for me, this meeting is really expensive. Let's get started. 
And that is that is where the start before the start or the unofficial start. Uh, that's where the magic uh, lies in that. There's magic in that deepness. And I'm reflecting on my own practice as I hear you talking about this going, hmm, am I doing things that are at the surface level chit chat or am I taking them deeper right away? And I probably have to challenge myself to do the deep connection more quickly than I have been so far. And I think I'm pretty, you know, pretty decent at this, but it's, there's always something that we can learn. We've already been, you know, chatting about this offline, the, how we approach our work with groups is that we're always learning. We can always do better next time and then the future. And so there's that future focus for you, but yeah, to go deep more quickly is so valuable for me to think more and do more on. And I want to offer a slight reframe, actually just as much for myself on the, the word deep or depth. Because I think that word, like if I say deeper connection in a group full of uh, chief human resource officers, they're like, well, lawsuits, like we can't talk about this stuff where there's boundaries, there's like this is what starts to get up. And so I would actually replace the continuum of like superficial to depth. I'd replace it with inauthentic to authentic. And so it, or, or realness is maybe a less charged word um, of like, no, I want to start off real. And I think for me, a shortcut or a cheat code to get real quickly is to connect to the purpose of why you're there in the meeting. The reason that introverts and or extroverts alike get hives when they hear the word icebreaker is because they're like, this is going to be the thing we do before we start the meeting. No, 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 no. Like for me, good connection before content, a good start is the start of the meeting. It warms people up. It gets people's personal experience tied into the the external purpose and uh, intent for that gathering or meeting. And so I was working with, um, I work with the Division of Blind and Visually Impaired in the um, U.S. They were teaching coding to a bunch of blind and visually impaired in, students. And they were like, well, I want to come up with an icebreaker to get these students connecting before diving into content of coding. Like I need people to feel comfortable and psychologically safe to ask questions during. I don't want people to go to module two without having really learned module one, right? So this is their their purpose, and which is getting at your larger question of like, what's the point of doing all of this? When I was working with it, consulting with them, um, they're saying, you know, what is an icebreaker that could work here? And the way that I came up with my answer, which I'll share in a moment, is thinking about, all right, what is, what is coding really about? What are some of the core like skills or ideas related to coding? What might attract somebody to coding? Um, and, and a big core of that is logic, right? It's like, if this uh, happens, then you do this. And there's a simplicity and a clearness in that world. And so we co-created live in the moment, this uh, icebreaker that I have a video on on YouTube and you just search icebreaker for logical people or something like that. But it's this if then icebreaker where you have one person come up with an if scenario. So if you uh, lost your keys, then... And they call out somebody else's name and they just fill in what they would do. And they just have these kind of pairs going ping pong back and forth, if then, if then. But it's framing the idea. So you're connecting, you're ideally peeling off some uh, layers. Some of the things that when we actually ran this activity, heaps of laughter uh, came flowing out. And so this idea that I had a mentor once who said that uh, laughter is nervousness leaving the body. And so it's like, there are some things that, you know, if you were gifted a unicorn when you were 16, because these are like middle school, high school, blind and visually impaired students learning coding. So there's some goofiness happening um, along the way. But then there's some serious ones, right? Like if your parents yell at you, then what do you do? And so, uh, but the, the idea that you can take, go right from that connection and right from that quote, start before the start and fold it right into we're going to learn coding. And in order to do that, you've got to learn if then statements. Yes. Yeah. I love it. There I, you go. <laughs> I call that a win-win. It's like, how do we have that activity, a win-win for the thing we're trying to do? It has to be connected, doesn't it? It has to be intentional and related because you're right. I, I actually avoid using the term icebreaker at all costs, I think, but you know, don't just put something in there for the sake of putting it in there. I love that you're really bringing a lot of intentionality to choosing that activity. Can I share one with you that I did just the other week? Please. I would love it. Yeah. Okay. So, and I was co-designing with a colleague of mine, Anna. And so I, I must credit Anna with this idea because I was working with Anna to develop the agenda for a second session that we were going to have with a group. And it was a group process facilitation. So the group needed to come together and agree on something. And 
we knew from the first meeting that, you know, there were, there were differences, you know, as there always are. People were kind of, you know, maybe they hold on to a position quite tightly, some people, and then some people couldn't care less and they let go of their position really easily and whatever. I said, I need some activity to get them started as kind of the check-in or, you know, warming up the unofficial start where I can help people realize that positionality piece and how we can use it as a bit of a jumping off point so that we can then talk about, yes, we all do have opinions about things, but other people do too. And how do we work with that? And how do we collaborate when people come with different opinions and blah, blah, blah. So she said, what about the cilantro basil mint? Do you know that one? No. So cilantro basil mint. And so it's kind of like, I knew this game as pancakes versus waffles. And in that duality, it was like, which one would you keep in the world while losing the other one forever? Okay. So would it be pancakes no. <laughs> or waffles? Like, you know, like, oh, choose pancakes. Somebody else would choose waffles. So this is cilantro basil mint. And so three choices, which of these would you keep in the world while losing the others forever? And of course, some people say basil, some people say cilantro, some people say mint. And it's fun, right? It is people get into it and they're, some people are taking the hard position and some people are, you know, whatever. And so then I was able to kind of debrief it and go, you know, how many people were really solid in their position and didn't want to let it go and, you know, kind of debrief the whole thing and then go into, okay, well, think about that and what happened in that activity and how that applies to our work together in this session. And what are we going to do about that? You know, how do we hold that in our minds where we have strong feelings, but other people do too? And, and how do we work together? So it was, it worked so well. It was so yeah, amazing. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And I think there's, there's something, you know, there's kind of the question of with both those ideas, how much do you front load the purpose and tell them like, this is why we're doing this versus cilantro basil mint, go choose. Yeah. My leaning or my bent is... I tend to clue people into the purpose and the intention before inviting them to do something because otherwise it's activity for activity's sake until I finally tell them. And so it's like, I don't ever want to uh, trick people or feel like I'm manipulating or guiding them toward a path. And so it's like, Hey, we're here to talk about decision-making. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to just throw out one of the most difficult decisions a human being can possibly make on planet earth. Cilantro, basil, mint, you got to get rid of one. What do you exactly. go for? <laughs> yeah. And I hope I did that. I think I did that too, because you're right. I was thinking about, especially not being preachy, you know, like I was worried about that in the debrief and anyway, so there, yeah, there are considerations around doing that kind of thing, but to, to have that win-win, yeah, it's a nice thing. It's quite beautiful. And uh, we could probably go on for the rest of the podcast, exchanging cool ideas. And that would probably be a useful uh, podcast at, at some level. But I wonder if we can do that under the casing of something we chatted about earlier, which is this idea of like, how do you engage folks that have their arms crossed uh, when they come in, which, you know, you're trying to kind of, kind of shared, you've got the joy of working with a lot of people who are enthusiastic and excited to be there. And that's not true for all learning professionals or facilitators or trainers. Um, I, a lot of people, the word mandatory somehow gets included in an email and then all your attendees show up with that word in the forefront of their brain. So I guess my brain is taking us there and I'm wondering if there's anything else you want to like put a capstone on the start, ironically enough, before possibly delving into that. Because I do think the start has a a really big impact in setting the tone for grumpy and enthusiastic people and everywhere in between. That's exactly where my brain was going, that it's a great thing to talk about when we talk about the start, because if you can't win them over in the start, then you've lost them already. Yeah. And actually, uh, Jan Keck was on the podcast not so long ago and said a very similar kind of thing that, you know, we have to figure out what to do about that. Just assume some people are going to be there, not by their own volition. So what do you do about that? What are the, some of the things you think about when you you know you're going to have some grumpy people in the room, as you call them? One, like a uh, big picture zoom out. I have... 100% of the organizations that I've uh, worked with, ranging from like K-12 schools to the CIA to universities to like big, big companies and little tech startups as well. Every single group that I walk into, very quickly, you can pick up almost like smell um, different states of mind. And three of the dominant ones that when I turn up are like, you've got critics, uh, consumers and contributors, right? So critics really comfortable pointing out what's wrong totally uninterested, uninterested in doing anything about it. Um, now, I'm, as I'm sharing these, they're going to sound like fixed traits or people. 
but they're very much for me like changeable states and we alternate between them on a moment to moment uh, basis. So critics, consumers kind of think about like people passively scrolling through. So if we want to take like a specific learning session context, this is somebody who in a virtual training is clicking through as fast as possible to get the credits they need to pass the thing or they're sitting in the back of the room trying to like keep their head low enough. They're, they're maybe soaking it in, they're getting some things, but they're just keeping their head under the radar for fear of it getting cut off. And then over this very important threshold, you have people who have chosen to uh, not be a victim of their world and to contribute, to actually add to. And it's a really big shift from saying the world is happening to me versus I get to happen to the world. Those are the three main buckets, probably on the polls. There's also, I'm going to label uh, curmudgeons, people who are in a perpetual state of crankiness that nothing you say or do will ever change their mind, or so it seems. And then even beyond contributors, I think you've got, in any group or organization, you've got connectors, people who are just hubs for contribution. That would be the simplest definition that I would offer for that. So if you think about engaging people across that whole spectrum of folks, I assume that depending on the morning that people had and the previous week and year and decade that people have had, that everybody is showing up in one of those five states or oscillating most between a couple of them. And so for me, the start before the start is if I start out and say, here's our agenda, this is what we're going to be doing. Let me talk about and like give the whole framing. And I look down and I'm seven minutes into the beginning of a gathering or meeting or training. And I've been the only one talking. I have forced people into the role of consumer or critic or curmudgeon. They can't be anything else. And so the idea of a start before the start is in the first couple minutes, how do I invite contribution? And so I was giving a keynote to 3,000 people who uh, run credit unions in the United States uh, a couple months ago. And the first sentence that I said on stage was, when you meet someone for the first time at a thing like this, what questions do you typically ask? And I waited for their responses, right? I was in conversation, even in this large group. And so it's not, for me, it's not a dynamic of like, oh, I'm talking to, it's, it's too big of a group. A, a leader will often give me uh, the loving excuse of like, well, you know, I got 40 staff. How, how, how do I invite contribution? This, is, this would take forever. It's not about hearing everyone. It's about offering the choice to contribute um, in that moment. And, and so that's the first thing is like, just a yes or no checkbox. Like, did you create an opportunity for someone to step into the role of contributor or connector? And if you didn't, then you can assume you're going to have consumers and uh, critics and that's it. Yeah. Oh, I like that. So quickly getting people into that, the role that you're hoping that they're going to be in, but you're saying we actually have a lot of impact in that we can help make those shifts happen between those roles. Yeah. And I think you're also saying too, I mean, when people work with big groups, we can so often think that that's going to force us into the role of speaker or presenter versus facilitator. And I think you're saying uh, we can be facilitators at any size of group. That is absolutely possible. Yeah. In fact, uh, Romy, who you've had on the podcast before, I was actually chatting with her and I was kind of encouraging her to consider doing more speaking. And she had this major resistance to it of like, I don't like I'm an experiential. And if you haven't, if you're listening to this and you haven't already listened to Romy's session on, you know, experiential uh, education do, cause she's amazing. Um, and the idea that speaking was an antonym for her to experience. I'm like, no, no, no. When I got hired to do a keynote, like I'm never spending more than 50% of the time talking. Half the time is active experience. And it's not just like quick little participatory things, um, because it's essential for me. I, I actually did a, one of my favorite, um, exercises to do with even a small group, but, but a big group, especially is this collaborative calculator exercise where I invite the group to just uh, do some mental math and then we're, tell them we're going to do some public math. The mental math is roughly how many years of experience do you have in your own world or niche? Then what I'm asking you to do is all at the same time, shout out that number. And I want you to listen for the average. So listen to like pick up as many numbers from the, the shouting that you can. And then I'm going to ask us to calculate roughly the average. So in this room of 3,000 folks I just mentioned, the average was 20. This is a se pretty senior group of people. So the average was 20 years of experience in a room of 3,000. That is 60,000 years of experience. So holy smokes, if I take my time and I'm the only one talking, that is a huge loss of knowledge. And so the, that's where the whole idea of designing for contribution, not just consumption comes from for me. And that like ethos and theory, and it bleeds into like, 
as I'm designing something, I'll go back with a highlighter on my iPad and just highlight all the places that I'm inviting people's contribution versus things that I'm saying. And if there's not enough color, then I need to go back to the drawing board. The super simple rule. Like if, if, if it's not colorful enough, if I haven't highlighted enough, like these are points where I'm inviting contribution or if they're not spaced out, right? Right. If I'm like, ooh, like this is like 45 minutes of talking to somebody and then five contribution things like the introverts can be tired at the end of that. <laughs> and so I need to, uh, you know, create some balance there. Yeah. And you have a way to check and balance that for yourself. I too do that. I have a column in my, my lesson plan document that's called participant activities. You know, there's facilitator activities and there's participant activities. And it's like, if that participant activities column says sitting and listening, you know, for more than a few minutes, really like I'm in trouble, I need to change something because that's too long. So I like that you have another way of color coding to kind of keep you, your feet to the fire for that as well. Thinking about those roles, you know, going back to the critic and the curmudgeon. So have you seen that those particular, you know, people with those roles ever, you know, briefly or long term, when you engage them faster and more often, do you see that shift happening? Yeah. So I would say one, and there's also uh, not just like my anecdotal experience, but there's a lot of research on the idea of connection before content and, and the impacts that it has in student engagement. Um, and so like, if you are deliberate about, and you do connection before content properly, more hands will be raised when you go to ask for questions, just like fundamentally, like the number of hands that will be uh, raised, go, go up. And so there's that element, but there's also uh, one of the studies that, that Priya Parker mentioned actually in her book briefly that I dove more into because I thought it was so fascinating was done at Johns Hopkins with surgical teams. So essentially Johns Hopkins wanted to reduce the amount of medical errors and deaths that were happening on the surgery table. It's like good effort. And so they tried all the multiple different interventions. One of the interventions was they didn't call it connection before content, but they got all the staff who were going to be involved in that surgery from the techs to the actual surgeon standing in a circle. And they all went around and said, hi, my name is blank. And this is my role in the surgery. And then they had the opportunity to share any concerns they had for the surgery. And in the group that did just that very simple little thing, medical errors and deaths were reduced by 35%. And so I'm like, most of the people that I work are not dealing in literally life and death scenarios, but they're always at risk of their meetings dying super hard. <laughs> right? Exactly. That's a nice quote there. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the idea of saving or putting the defibrillator paddles on your meeting. So your question as I understood it was, does this early engagement really help shift the state of mind of somebody who may have entered with their arms crossed in that critic or curmudgeon state? And again, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Like these are not fixed people. Like they're, I've got a vacuum at home um, that is, when you stand it up, it just falls over. It's the dumbest design of a vacuum ever. It's so foolish, but I'm not going to call the vacuum company and track down the designers on LinkedIn and let them know that they need to fix and adjust this. I'm just a critic. I'm pointing out what's wrong with no intention of doing anything about it. And so recognizing that like on a daily basis, we probably float through all five of those. So I can't make anybody switch. The only thing I can do as a, as a designer is give, like put a choice in front of somebody and make it a compelling and valuable and purposeful enough choice to actually cross over the land, into the land of contribution. I will say there's one important thing. And when we were offline, you had mentioned your affinity for the word intention. I share that affinity. And uh, I think for curmudgeon specifically, people who are in a perpetual state of crankiness, learning to become fluent in the language of intention is super flippant important. Because if they don't know why they're contributing or why they're being asked to contribute, they will resent it and fall deeper into that role of uh, curmudgeon. And so when I say speak the language of intention, I mean before any request or ask, hey, the intention of us doing this right now is there's 60,000 years of experience in the room and I could just tell you what I think, but what we're going to do over the next 10 minutes in this big conversation swap is exchange as much of that experience and knowledge as possible so you all end up smarter at the end of this 10 minutes. A curmudgeon can get on board with that. Yeah. Right? It's like, that's actually kind of cool. I'm interested. Let's go. Maybe they're curmudgeonly because they haven't actually been asked for their opinion very much lately, you know, and they're yeah. just tired of it because they have worked at the company for 20 or 30 years or even five. I mean, you can be really, you know, you bring a lot of experience from other roles or whatever, but do we force people into the curmudgeon 
mindset or state because we actually haven't taken intention to previous, you know, or somebody, not, not us, Chad, but (laughs) but those other people people out there have not asked for people to share their experience with each other or created opportunities for them to get to know each other or whatever. You know, you talked about the future state. I want people to leave my session, especially when they actually work together, like an intact group, so important that they learn that they need to draw on each other for support and guidance and experience and, and help because we're better together. Like if they, if they're so siloed and I hear that a lot these days, because, you know, a lot of people are still working from home or they're kind of in the half in the office or whatever. And so it is a win for me if I can help them turn to each other in the session Because the future hopefully looks a lot like that. Yeah. What are you thinking there? Like, are you intentionally thinking about that as well as when people leave? Or maybe we'll go towards the, you know, the closing pieces that you do. Like, how do you get people to leave your time with them so that that future looks brighter and more effective and, you know, better in whatever ways? Yeah, I think one, it's, I wonder, I don't know this, but I wonder if it's hard to feel, uh, leave anything feeling excited about the future if you were if your perspective wasn't heard in some capacity i think there's there's a essential element of uh, that and it it reminds me of a session i led uh many years ago with a group of ceos of like mid-sized companies so it was about 20 um ceos mid-sized company i was in philadelphia and they didn't know this, but I had, uh, I went to Glassdoor, the site where people review, you know, I'll give a company a rating and reviews. And I went to the site and had somebody on my team go to Glassdoor and pull all the reviews off and then anonymize them, print them out and cut them into little segments of paper. So like a little segment of review. And when they walked into the room, I said, Hey, welcome. Um, your glass door reviews are sitting on these tables right now. Ooh, the cringe a little bit. Some of them are written in all caps and they're not super beautiful. Some of them are very beautiful. What I want you to do is, and they're all mixed together, right? So you don't know who's, uh, which reviews are coming from which. What I want you to do is sort these reviews into buckets and categories and figure out why people are staying and why people are leaving your organization. First of all, like fun exercise um, to do. What they found, which I did not realize um, until they illuminated is that nine out of 10 reviews talking about why somebody stayed or left a company, like specifically referencing why they stayed or why they left, had the word listen or a synonym in it. Wow. My manager, I had all these great ideas, shared them with my manager and nothing ever happened. Or I get to contribute my ideas regularly and get to see it like flown out to hundreds of clients. It's awesome. It's really satisfying. It's purposeful work, blah, blah, blah. And so that idea getting, you know, thinking about someone being excited about the future, people who are excited about their future in a particular like role or context stay at that organization. So I don't know exactly what the relationship is between listening and excitement about the the, the future, but there's something really important there in terms of the curmudgeon critic dynamic. It's, it's a very obvious and huge component of like, if it's not, if you're listening or not, it's do the people around you feel heard when they leave and not just feel heard, are they actually heard? And so, yeah, it's just a like telling stat that stands in my, in my brain there. And that is related to meetings and learning experiences, isn't it? And daily life on the job as well. This whole piece around listening, I mean, we're ostensibly talking about learning events and, and meetings, and but it's really how do we take this mindset around well, you're saying connection before content. It's connection through content and through every relationship we've ever had with these people, especially if we're colleagues of them. And how do we help people feel heard and feel listened to? And then they will engage and stay. It's kind of related to that quiet quitting thing that I'm hearing about. I, I haven't looked at it, into it too much, but is it related to that where it's like, is quiet quitting, like you're just mentally checking out of the building, but you're still there, right? Like you maybe don't feel heard. You, you are going to leave soon because of some of these things that are happening. Or, or the quiet quitting is is the stepping from contributor down to the consumer or critic yeah. uh, bucket because you're like, hey, I've, I've tried to contribute. And this happens all the time. Starry-eyed, excited, uh, like first-year employees come in with all these really great ideas and they just get the life stomped out of them and until they fall into the role of consumer. And then we used to just stick around in those roles for a couple decades, but there's no tolerance for that anymore. And so people uh, either literally quit or they just totally check out and, and stop contributing altogether. 
Yeah. So we're talking about facilitation, but we're really talking about work and life. And all of these are totally applicable skills to just being with people in the world. Like how do we involve people? How do we create connection where people feel heard and seen and can contribute in the wonderful ways they can? Yeah. And I wonder, this is a, at the risk of sharing something mildly heavy, but you know, every once in a while, I'll get down these like really deep curiosity rabbit holes of topics that I'm not an expert in, but I want to know more about. And lately, artificial intelligence has been it for me. And so I've gone like deep, listen to hours and hours of interviews from Sam Altman, the founder of OpenAI, who created ChatGPT and all this stuff. And there's this one interviewer, Reed Hoffman, one of the founders of LinkedIn, was interviewing Sam Altman and asked, you know, if AI is doing all of this amazing stuff for us and we have so much less work to do, there's less of a need. Um, ironically, it's going to kind of start with cutting out creative jobs and white collar jobs. We thought it was going to go the other way around and replace blue collar jobs first and then, then up the ladder, but it's happening the other direction. So if there's not all the stuff for us to do and we don't, we can't stake an identity in um, productivity and grinding 40 plus hours a week, what will we care about? This was what Reed asked Sam. And Sam's response I thought was really interesting. He said, what we cared about 50,000 years ago is going to be more what we care about in the next 100 years than what we have in, in the last 100 years. So in the last 100 years, thinking about uh, efficiency and making things more uh, productive versus 50,000 years ago, we're like, community, it's just focus on survival, recreation, got a lot of time to kill. Life's pretty simple, like hunt, gather. Um, and I'm not saying that we're going to go down to sticks and stones um, age, but just saying he's like, we're going to care about connection and recreation a lot more. We're going to prioritize connection and recreation a lot more than we currently do. Because we might mentally prioritize and know it's important. But I had a client once recognize on the call with me, she was like, holy smokes, I say that connection with my kid is really important, but I can't remember the last time that I had eight totally focused hours in a day where I was doing nothing, paying attention to them. But I do that five days a week with my work. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. So where are we <laughs> placing the emphasis, right? Like the yeah. most importance, you know, where is it going in our lives? Oh, this is getting yeah. deep. <laughs> this is like, like you're questioning the whole society that, you know, we, we live in maybe here in North America and other other places as well. And what where it's going. Talk about future chat. <laughs> That's a real future statement. I, I know. Well, when I mention when I start to mention and go down the artificial intelligence rabbit hole, Kate, my wife, is always like, please don't like just in the last like month or two, she's like, please don't bring this up around your clients. Like you just need to really like this is some intense stuff. Like just rein it in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems so complicated, but it's not like you're, you're kind of encouraging me to think it's not as complicated as we, as people think it is. I mean, to be able to connect with each other, it's not super complicated. We just have to do it. You know, we just have to, you know, educate ourselves as to how to do it and actually do it. Not just say that we like it. You know, some people might say, oh yeah, I really like it when people do this in their, in their meetings or in their learning events, but I don't really have time to do it myself. It's like, we just have to know how to do it and do it. Yeah. I was talking to an education client earlier, talking about connection before content and the ideal of connecting people to the purpose of why they're there and to each other. And so I just tossed a prompt into ChatGPT and said, generate 10 connection questions to help my high school biology students connect with each other and the topic of the day, which is mitochondria. And immediately it popped out. Have you heard of mitochondria before this class? What do you think they are responsible for in the cell? What do you know about the structure of mitochondria and how do they produce energy for cell? Can you, right? So just like the idea, which I'm not convinced that these are like the best questions, but I think it was easy before we had tools to generate it. But I think like if you're not feeling creative and you're like, oh, I don't know how to connect with this group and tie it into purpose and what do I do? Ask ChatGPT. <laughs> you'll, you'll get some responses, right? You'll have that uh, list. It's pretty, pretty fascinating to uh, consider the ramifications in the next couple of years of what happens when we outsource our intention um, or say like, hey, can you come up like I'm meeting with this group of people? I'm not really sure exactly what the uh, purpose is. Can you come up with the purpose and be and and put it in a really snappy, sharp, compelling statement that includes the needs of everybody in the room? It's like, that'd be a useful sentence to have. Maybe. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what are the things that only humans can do? And can we do more of that? Yeah. We should talk about closings. Are there certain things that you want to share about the bookend of really bringing importance and intentionality to those openings, but also closings? Like why are closings so crucial to think about as well? 
Yeah. So just one like foundational basic psychology 101 level, you have the primacy recency effect. So we tend to remember what happens first and last most. Um, and we know this, we've studied this, like we, what happens in the middle, we remember bits of but what happens first and last, we really tend to uh, remember. And yet most meetings and even my own, when I'm not being intentional end in a rush to the next one or a quick, like, Oh, I didn't realize what time it was. Ah, see ya. And so when I'm really on my game, which is uh, let's say half the time <laughs> when I'm, when I'm focused and I'm being intentional, I'm like all but setting an alarm for five minutes before the end of a meeting or gathering and saying it's time to switch over to do really intentional closing to like tie this all up. Now that looks, there's a million different exercises that um, you can do. One of my favorites I learned from a facilitator in New Hampshire named Nate Folan, and he learned it from somebody else who probably learned it from somebody else who's probably dead. Um, and so I don't know who to credit it to, but the, the exercise is called uh, group anthem. And really simply, you just invite uh, a whole group to make a closing statement based on the time that you spent with them. So whether it was a half hour quick uh, learning boost or a two day offsite with a group, make a closing statement that you want to share with everybody else. And it could be about something uh, you're really excited you picked up. It could be about something you're still wrestling with that you're doubting. It could be about something you're, you, you're excited to take action on. The only catch is that the closing statement must begin with either I am, I believe, or I will. And so you don't have to sing it, but as we share our closing statements, it's going to sound a bit like an anthem because every sentence is going to begin with I am, I believe, or I will. 30 seconds to think, and then whoever wants to go first can go from there. Ending like that which if you're somebody listening to this in a role that can actually lead that, do it. It's a really fun exercise and record it too because um, you want to send it back to either your team or your client or whatever because it's like gold always just comes out there because the like social pressure to come up with something that's like worth sharing with the rest of the group is high enough, but you've taken some risk away by saying your sentence starts with these two words. Yeah, it's a little easier to enter into it. Yeah, and do you have them do it one by one? Or do they really sing it or say it all at the same time? Like, Whoa. oh, no, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I love doing it one by one. So virtually I tell people to go into speaker view so that when they talk, they show up big. So it's like a human slideshow happening um, instead of gallery view. Like who said that? Uh, and you can't see where it came from in person. Yeah. And I, and I let it take a little bit of time. I let some silence in between. It's not a like fast paced, rah, 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 electronic music playing in the background kind of exercise. It's a like really thoughtful, intentional way to wrap up an end, which is not always the way that I want to wrap up an end, but yeah, it's something that I've really appreciated doing over the, over the years. That's nice. Do you want to do it ourselves? Let's do it right now. <laughs> I believe that all people have what they need to bring connection to their meetings and their learning events. I love it. And their <laughs> life and their work. What about you? Um, I am reminded of the value of spontaneous conversation. In our conversation here, we didn't have a map. You didn't have a, like, here's the 20 questions we're going to go through. And I'm just reminded of the beauty and, and magic that can show up when you're just present talking with somebody, exploring an idea and letting everything else not exist for a period of time. I've so enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Chad, for being here. I'm going to definitely keep watching you. I think you're doing some great work in the world. And thank you for what you're doing and for having this conversation with me today. Thanks for inviting me on. I really enjoyed my conversation with Chad. I could probably detail so many things that are still resonating with me from our conversation. One of the things I appreciated learning about from him are these different states of mind that our participants could be in in our sessions. So they could be critics, they could be consumers, they could be curmudgeons, but they also could be contributors and they can be connectors. And we hope that they are going to be those last two ones, I think most of all, but we just have to recognize that there are these several states of mind that people probably will be in and what do we do to help to shift them into the direction we want them to go by the things that we design into our session that are focused on connection and connection before content, as Chad would say. So lots of stuff to learn from Chad. And I encourage you to go check out his website where he actually shares a lot of free resources for people that help you in this direction to go in the direction of connection before content as well.
In the next episode of the podcast, I will do some ruminating on the self-doubt that many of us experience as designers and facilitators of learning, particularly on the facilitation side, dealing with imposter syndrome. Why do we have this? Why do we all seem to have something like this as human beings working in this courageous, vulnerable field? And what do we do about that? What are the things that we can do to fly in the face of imposter syndrome, to deal with it and to not let it stop us in our tracks? So join me next time for dealing with self-doubt on the podcast. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Facilitating On Purpose. If you were inspired by something in this episode, please share it with a friend or a colleague to help them expand their facilitation practice too. To find the show notes, give me feedback or submit ideas for future episodes, visit facilitatingonpurpose.com. Special thanks to Mary Chan at Organized Sound Productions for producing this episode. Happy facilitating!